Good morning, it's Brian here from Expert Dojo. Today, I have this is such a wonderful pleasure. I have Carl here from Biotessere. We had the pleasure of investing in Carl and this wonderful company, and I like it a lot. Look, we at Expert Dojo have the opportunity to invest in beautiful companies and wonderful founders who are changing the world. And because of the Healthcare Accelerator program, we have the opportunity to invest in people who are really bringing just immense change. But I love my dogs. I love my dog. Like my little girl, Chula, is definitely the only one in the family who comes running to me every day when I come home. The rest of the family run away from me all the time, which just reinforces how incredibly good judges of character they are and how bad humans are. And I love the mission that Carl and his team have. I love how focused they are in making the lives of our four-legged friends the most brilliant possible. And I really struggle with the current status quo. And we're going to dig in a little bit into the product, but the more that you look at what they're doing and what they're bringing to the world, the more you're going to look and say, did we really allow this to happen for this long? Did we really accept that it was okay for our wonderful pets to be treated in this way for so many years without ever questioning it, just looking at it as a pure financial equation. I think you'll be as surprised as I was when I first got into the conversations on this and as excited as I am when we got to invest into it. So Carl, take me back to the beginning. And before we go into the solution and what you came up with, talk to us about the genesis of the idea. And then as we go through this podcast, the vast majority of people listening are investors. And what they're looking for is, you know, execution, what you've done to prove that you and the team are great executors, the skill gapping. They want to be able to see that you have incredible skills across. And by the way, if there are skills missing, it's okay because the skills move from your pre-seed to seed and seed to Sirius A and Sirius A onwards, et cetera, et cetera. They're looking for the size of the market. Does this have something that can potentially bring in a couple of million to $10 million a month in revenue, potentially? They're looking for, do you have the chops to be able to raise the money to get you to that next level? Um, and can we see immediate revenue that's coming through soon? But take us back right to, so as we go through that, I'll guide those questions out of you, but or those answers out of you, but take us back to the beginning, first of all. When was it that you realized it was a huge problem and even that you could potentially be a part of the solution? So it goes back about, about five years at the very least, if not six and um, I was working at another uh, biotech company and they uh, Sarepta Biotherapeutics. Uh, they had, uh, they, they worked in uh, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy and they brought me on to do some uh, cancer immunotherapy. Uh, that was my background previously in my postdoc, as well as in, I had my own lab in uh, Rush University in Chicago and we, we, we studied that quite a bit. Um, but I was fortunate enough to interact with people at the Carlson College of Veterinary Medicine and started chatting with the veterinary oncologist, Shai Braca. And we started talking about what happens to dogs. He was studying some uh, osteosarcoma, bone cancer. And we were started looking at, uh, you know, collaborating and doing some work together. And he just started telling me the story of what goes on. And I was just shocked because I had been at the forefront, you know, working at the forefront of, you know, immunotherapies and, and some of these therapies, you know, just shifted the paradigm of the treatment of people with cancer. And he was telling me, you know, they, they're still using the traditional chemotherapies that have been used since the 1940s. And, you know, it, it, it it's not working very well. <laughs> and so from there, we started, you know, chatting more and more and the opportunity came up and we joined with, um, uh, Chris Zebra, who also works at the hospital and uh, the, the veterinary medicine, the hospital, and he's a expert in camelid biology and his, he, he brings to the field, uh, the platform that we're using. So camelid such as alpacas, llamas, and even sharks, surprisingly enough, produce a unique antibody that can be manipulated to be really, really small. And in, in technical terms, it's called a nanobody. So um, mm -hmm. it, it's used occasionally here and there, and there is one drug approved in the human clinic that uh, uses that sort of platform. 
But we just saw that this would be a great place for us to put it in is into the canine cancer market. And there's just nothing there available for them. And it's something that it would be easy to produce. It would be uh, durable. It would create a lot of um, uh, lack, lack of issues of, of cost and such. Uh, one of the, the problems with uh, therapies in humans is the cost can run up to $120,000, $150,000. Uh, so, but we're dealing with pets and in order to bring those costs down, we bring down the production. So that's kind of how we started. Uh, and it's just grown from there. We've had the ability to start to produce um, some different sequences that were specific for targets in canine cancer. And from there, we've you know built some uh, intellectual property that we're working on right now to establish a long-term license. But it's been slow going with COVID just because you can't get in the lab as often. And there were a number of different things that changed, but we kept pushing, pushing through. Talk to me about some of the milestones that really encouraged you, because I would say, especially in the biospace, it's such a, it's such a high and a low space, right? Because you try and you try and you try and you look at all the variations and then something incredible happens. And it doesn't mean even need to be this incredible. It's even as this incredible. And you're like, I'm right. We're on to something here. And you stick with it. And then you get to another milestone and another one and another one. Talk me through just from when you began out and you started to look into it and see where the correlation was to actually where you've come to today. What are some of those incredible milestones that made you realize that you are absolutely onto something? So the first one was, of course, you know, can we can we actually make this work? And so some of the early experimentation we would we had to immunize some uh, alpacas and then determine if we actually were able to induce an immune response. And we did find that they, that, that they worked. So that was a really good start. And that was kind of one of the cornerstones for our intellectual property. And then from there, we basically had to screen the, the totality of, of the immune response of that animal and basically go through and dig out. Uh, we ended up digging out about 30 different sequences that we could use and put forward to the uh, the, uh, patent office. And that was one of the big milestones was being able to get it into the patent. So there were a number of different hurdles that we had to reach. Uh, they accepted it. They were able to, uh, give us an early publication date, which we're expecting in the next few months. And that was really validation of what we were doing. Um, the next set of validations and milestones had to do with our production of it. Um, we felt that, there are some traditional ways that you can produce biologics and antibodies, but there are more innovative approaches that will bring down costs and speed things up. So we started looking at uh, these sorts of um, production systems, um, mainly in the yeast compared to some other uh, molecules. And being here in Oregon, there's a lot of yeast around with the beer and the wine. So uh, it just seemed to make sense. Um, but we were able to start to connect with people from MIT and they kind of directed us towards this group in Boston that was kind of, you know, at they're, they're at the beginning of their process too, but they had uh, production values that would really meld and synergize with what we're doing. And they were excited because they saw what we were doing and what the potential was and how fast things could get done. So they, they themselves are excited too. <laughs> and so that was another milestone that we were able to meet that we could then produce um, our drug and from there, we've had uh, a milestone. We were part of the i program through NSF and we're able to generate a lot of interesting marketing data, understanding our customer base and understanding what their needs were, as well as understanding you know, how this would work in a, in, in a business itself. So those are, those are kind of the three main uh, milestones that I think we've reached that really have uh, pro provided us the, the uh, the, uh, the the validation that we need. Wonderful. And and normally when I'm following the uh, format, my anchors on on how we go with the interview, I try and contextualize it so that I can get the answers that all the questions are looking for. But I love bringing you through the hero's journey. And the hero's journey is a little bit like watching a Zorro movie, right? At the beginning of the movie, you get to know Zorro. Zorro's a great guy. Everybody wants Zorro to win. And then you see the bad guy, right? And then the bad guy comes out. And normally it's a Spanish general, right? Who's gone rogue. And then the bad guy, 
then does terrible things to Zaro. And you almost get to a stage where like Zaro was lying on the ground with his sword up as the bad guy is banging his sword down. And you're thinking, oh my God, Zaro can't survive. And then he pushes up with his sword and he comes through. So in your case, what were some of those moments in the early days when you're starting out on your hero's journey and you were starting to think, oh, I don't know how much of this I can take. <laughs> and they may have been partners or teammates. You don't need to mention names, but they might be partners or team members that you thought would be incredible and they weren't. It might have been breakthroughs that you'd hoped would come earlier, but they didn't. They might have been finance. It's always financiers, <laughs> generally investors. I didn't find that like, if there's a disappointment section in anything, you could just like automatically leave investors in there right on the top, right? But, um, but what were the tough stuff that you had to go through? So, I mean, I, I think the first one was just basically getting the work started. Um, so once we got the work started, then the big one became the production part. We, like I said, we wanted to go into yeast and um, there are groups here uh, at o Oregon State University, obviously, since <laughs> there's a lot of beer and wine that goes on. So we, we, we worked with some of them. We sent them some money to, to grow up our product. And um, this was around the same time as COVID. So what happened was, is that they sent us compounds and stuff and it, there was nothing there and it drove us crazy. And they then burned through all our money and we were left with nothing. And so we had to do it on our own. So we started on our own and uh, we were having the same problem. We were just getting nothing and we just couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, we were able to bring in enough money so that we could actually have another commercial entity outside of OSU uh, produce it. And they could not produce this, 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 one, <laughs> this one sequence that we had. And so it made us feel, feel good, but it was just one of those things where we would spend days and days just growing liters and liters of this, this compound and getting nothing. Uh, it wasn't until that we were able to determine that it was, there was something else wrong. Um, that we moved forward and we, we found a number of other different options that we could uh, uh, substitute and, and, and create actually something even better. So it was one of those moments where, you know, you're down, you're down and you keep fighting. And then you realize <laughs> that, you know, there's a lever over there. You just got to switch it. And then, you know, the, the, the bag comes down and sweeps away the villain. <laughs> And how did you build a team around you? Because it's wonderful. Like those moments are incredible because they push you against the wall. But a lot of the time, the only one who's able to make it through those early days is the founders themselves because nobody else, like everybody else is like, no, I like, I love dogs. Dogs are the best, but are you kidding me? It's all day, every day, grueling. How, how did you find the development of the team and, and what happened within the team itself, both from then to today? over that period? So, I mean, the team has been really, uh, really uh, solid in the fact that, you know, we haven't wavered from what we want to do. Um, there, there's, a, there's a strong commitment to what we started out with. I think obviously we've, we've, we've faced frustration along the way. It's taken a lot longer than we thought, but we are making headway. And I think that the more and more we, we, we connect with each other, we, we're just kind of you know, we have the same goals. And when you have the same goals, it's really easy to, to work with one another. There, there, there aren't any ulterior motives. There aren't any issues. So the founders themselves, we've been really chugging along quite well. Um, and we're starting to increase the size of our team. We're bringing on others um, to partnership with us. And what we're hearing is that, you know, they're, they have the same goals too. So I think there's this, this alignment of, of our goals that, kind of not only keeps us, you know, together and keeps us sane, but it's also attracting other people. And um, we've had someone, uh, Chad McBride, join us from, uh, he was a former uh, business development guy at Alonco, one of the big veterinary drug companies out there. And he's been wonderful. He's been helping us. He's excited about what we're doing. He sees the potential, obviously coming from a veterinary side of um, a commercialized company, a very large one. And he's been very uh, supportive and he's, he's on board. It's, it, it's really easy when you have those people. Again, we also have um, several partnerships with uh, production, uh, Sunflower Production, Sunflower Therapeutics out in Boston is the one that's going to help us. And uh, Laura and her team have just been, they're, they're excited to work with us. So um, 
and they're aligned too. And they, 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 they have this idea, you know, I mean, if we can produce this for, for dogs, they can go and they can actually produce drugs also for humans in, in, in unmet areas around the country. Um, their, their, their platform allows it to be taken to any part of the world and you can suddenly produce drugs uh, as, as, as you need them. So countries in Africa or in Asia or in South America or anywhere, um, you can, they can reach out to it. So they see that, you know, they have an alignment. We want to help make society better. We want to help our pets better. They, they agree. So I, I think that, you know, as far as all those hiccups go, we've been real fortunate. We've just, we've just attracted the right people. And, and I think it's just the, like you said, I mean, everybody loves dogs. There, there's an alignment there and people, people work and we work well together. You know, there's a lovely phrase from Gary Player, which is the more I practice, the luckier I get, right? So I think great teams keep great teams together and evolve them into a new place. The only surprise for me is I kind of thought you might say regulatory, right. but she didn't say it. Like, is it because they've just been beautifully and, and lovely and all huggy and wonderful with you or because you just feel really good about it. Look, one of the one what I do find with very um deep domain experienced founders is that they don't really see regulatory as a problem because they understand the process so well that they've prepared themselves mentally for the process, right? right. It's folks who come who come very new into the industry. They're like, this is ridiculous. I can't believe it. You know, the person they're sitting here and it's got to go from this department. And you're like, just chill, because this is a system. And the system works in a particular way. How have you navigated that whole process? Because obviously it's a big deal, right? Right. So, I mean, uh, coming, uh, two of the founders, myself and uh, Dan Moritz, we, we came from uh, the human clinic and we've had to deal with the FDA. And we had to, if, if everybody knows about business, about Sarepta, Sarepta was a small little company. And, you know, when they got their drug approved, uh, you know, uh, news magazines like The Economist wrote about, you know, oh, my God, the FDA is broken because they let Sarepta through. And so uh, there's a lot of regulatory that we, I've dealt with. And uh, so is Dan, uh, white papers written, um, dealing with that. And the FDA is just uh, their adversary. Uh, that, that's their job. Yeah. But when we moved into veterinary health, we found that we wouldn't be actually dealing with the FDA. We'd be dealing with the USDA. Mm. And they have a different approach. We've chatted with... Um, uh, a partner that we have. She was the former uh, head of the department that we'd be working with, the Center for uh, Veterinary Biologics at the USDA. She'd spent 30 years there. Uh, we've chatted with her and um, the process is very different. And so is the mentality. They're there to get things forward, move them into to, to patients. So they're willing to help you. They're willing to work with you to try to figure out the best solution, which is quite the opposite of what, like I said, my training was and what uh, Dan's training was as far as the FDA. So we find that the regulatory element is something that we can work with instead of working against. And that's going to go really far um, once we uh, move forward into discussions with them in the next, uh, we're hoping in the next three to six months. How wonderful, right? Did you find yourself sitting in a room saying, oh, this is so nice. Really? It is. You really, what, you, you're not asking me to send any papers back and you review it in a while. You're actually saying you're going to collaborate and help us reach a better objective. Like it, it's just such a joy, right? And it also shows you, look, I'm, look we all love humans, but, but there's just a lot of us, right? But when it comes to animals, I believe that, I don't, I can't say that, that they love more than the FDA. I just, you just got to feel that the people are there are so deep in with our pets that they know that not even nearly enough has been done, right? I think that's the bigger problem and that we need way more folks like you who are out there. So we've got the team, which is killer. We've got the regulation, which you're going through. How, how long is that process generally? And I understand this is slightly of an arbitrary question, right? Because it can go anywhere. We don't quite know. But what's your feel on what it will look like? And what are some potential hypothetical um, scenarios that maybe we can play out? They don't all have to be perfectly positive <laughs> scenarios because this is life, right? But And Murphy's Law is alive and well. But throw us out some scenarios with some timescales, maybe with some 
some funding objectives around it? Because right now the investors are looking and saying, we don't need your guarantee. We understand how early stage startup works, but we're just trying to understand what might happen and what you might need. And, and the first thing is, is, you know, as I mentioned before, is that, you know, there's this, this, this difference between FDA and the USDA. And one of the big differences is that they tend to want to know what you're putting into animals and um, how you're going to make it. So manufacturing is one of the big things. They have a, a set of standards that you have to send them prior to any discussions about your clinical trials. So they want to make sure that what you're sending them is what you're going to be using. And that's the standard that you use throughout any sort of clinical uh, um, discussions as well as any clinical trials. So that process, understanding how things are produced and what is produced are the, the main goals at the early stage. So one of the big things is to just basically produce enough of the drug as a standard so that we can uh, approach the USDA. They'll then go through, they'll test everything, they'll, they'll make sure everything's um, acceptable to them. And then once they give approval to that, then you can produce more that you will then put into a clinical trial. So as you can see, there are these different steps that come up, you know, there'll be a, a need to produce the first standards. Um, and then there'll be the need for the second standards, not the second standards, but the actual drug that you'll be putting into a, a, a clinical test. So these are different areas that things can go well, things can have problems, but as always, you know, you can always go back and rectify them before you get to the more expensive elements of like a larger clinical trial where you're actually producing a lot of drug and you're also having to interact with patients, providers, and those sorts of entities. And what does the timeline look for look like for both? Smaller so, clinical trials, longer clinical trials, right. conversation backwards and forwards. How right. much money do you think we're going to need to get us through them? And then the insanely optimistic perspective of like life just gives you a gift for you. It's your birthday every day. And then the very pessimistic perspective and everything right. in the middle. Right. I think that for the timeline, I mean, the, the timeline is kind of set. So they have a certain three month window where they will discuss initially your, 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 your initial um, presentation to them. Um, and then after you've done that, they will say, go ahead and then send us all the amount of drug that you want to be tested. So during that stage, you know, it could be anywhere from three to six months to produce we send that to them and then they take a hard six months to basically analyze and go through every, every bit of that. So hypothetically, that's, that's a big chunk of time, you know, anywhere from nine months to potentially a year before mm -hmm. we can actually even start talking about putting it into an animal clinical trial. And then at that stage, um, we also will be talking about to the USDA about what the clinical trial will look like how much we need to do, how many patients, what, what our outcomes will look like, um, and basically go through and set up the parameters there. And from what I've heard from um, our, our contact at the, that's gonna help us with the regulatory is that they're trying to figure it out themselves, especially for this, um, this, this type of drug platform that we're using, and then also for the types of drugs we're using. So there, there, there's probably going to be a lot of back and forth, but I, I think there's going to be a lot of a potential area for us to make an agreement and find a, a middle ground that could work for both uh, us as a company and then also for the USDA. Um, as far as the, the amount of money goes, I mean, it'll, it'll all depend on how much it costs to produce the drug and how much the USDA will ask from us. Um, at this stage, you know, we know that we can produce at least one kilogram of drug for uh, about half a million dollars. Um, we probably won't need a full kilogram of drugs, so we can probably get away with less. Um, and it all depends on our discussions with Sunflower as far as bringing that down even further. Um, from what we've been told is that there's no really large fee that needs to be paid like um, uh, an NDA that you normally do for USD, uh, for the FDA. Um, there are gonna be fees and other sorts of things that are in place but we haven't um, heard um, too much as far as the cost being significant at all. Um, so those should be manageable, but um, those are, those are kind of the biggest costs that we're going to face. The, the clinical trial is a big deal. Um, it's a big black box because we're not certain how the USDA wants to, us to approach it. So that's where it becomes kind of uh, a little nerve wracking. And, you know, that's where the danger strikes is that, 
they could be asking for a lot. And we know that, you know, it takes a um, significant amount of money to put a clinical to trial together. Um, there, there are reimbursements to the patients and to the different, uh, different entities that will be running it. So fortunately, we have the right people in place. We have um, a, a veterinary oncologist who has run some, some trials already. Um, he's worked with some of the best in the country. Um, there's a chance he'll work at the best place in the country at uh, Ohio State, they have a really wonderful clinical trials group. So I think that those discussions are, are, are ongoing and um, have just begun. So again, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here, but I think we have the right people in the right place to actually make it, uh, make it smooth. Wonderful. And then if things were to go medium to good to get to market, what do you think? Right. So the USDA offers us a number of different kind of off ramps, so to speak. So once we determine if um, our drug is safe to use, which could take um, you know anywhere from three months to six months, um, another case could be a year. But after that, they can uh, offer us what would be conditional licensure. So it's safe to use, but the efficacy hasn't been established yet. Yeah, so during good. that stage, we can actually sell the drug for the specific conditions that we're treating to patients while we continue to gather um, valuable efficacy data from the other animals in the study or from new animals. Um, and it allows us a, a nice respite to, to basically gather that data. And sometimes it takes up to five years. Sometimes, you know, if things go well, it could take a year um, before you get close to um, full approval. It, it all depends on how things work out and we won't know until we get into that situation. But it's what, what, what I'm hearing is the process is so much simpler. Than yes. For, it's just so much simpler. Like you could be talking five, 10 years if you're talking about humans, you know, what's, um, and what also what's really encouraging to me. And it was really encouraging right from the very first conversation we had. The alternative is just not worth thinking about. Like it's just not. And that's the problem. Like, no matter, and, and, and so, and I, I preface this by saying we have brilliant people who are co who are founders that have deep domain experience in the space that understand this. This is not your first rodeo. You've done this times before. You understand the process of elimination that's required to get this built properly. You understand the process of regulation to get this through. Um, and you have a very willing group of people because of those facts because they're going to look at you and say well hang on a second their heartbeats are worth so much more than trying to get something through that's not necessary but just going back to my first point here is the alternative is 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 not even thinkable there is no solution out there like the very worst thing that could happen with you is that those poor animals get to the same place that that was going to happen anyway so it is obviously nothing is going to go to market until it's perfect. But what I'm trying to say is there would be wonderful headwinds in helping you get to the place that you want to go to rather than a bunch of people fighting you to try and get something to market of which there are 400 other solutions, but just slightly different on how the indication is is taken transmitted you know brought it like it's just too friggin important for it not to work and that to me says that because i love i love when there's frictionless innovation or frictionless innovation doesn't mean it's not hard it just means that you don't have to fight idiots because you're dealing with politics and stupid things and and even people doing the right thing but just doing the doing it the wrong way in your case i just feel like that you will have a lot of folks in your corner wanting this to win. Am I being too optimistic here? Which, by the way, is always an oxymoron for an investor. But, 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 but what, are your, what are your thoughts just on what I'm saying? No, I, I think there is a great need. And it's, it's interesting when we talk to just veterinary oncologists and veterinarians in general, uh, they are clamoring for something new, anything. They just, they, 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 they've been dealing with the same status quo for, for, for decades and nothing's changed. And so there is, there is a push, you know, like you said, you know, people are wanting to help you work these things through. They're more than willing to, you know, be a site that you can have these uh, different trials at. 
Uh, they're, they're more than willing to, you know, give them tests and, you know, make some shout outs at different meetings and stuff. There's just, um, they see it all the time. And I think they're on the front lines. They see the, the, the sadness and the, and the pain and the misery that, that already exists. There's, you know, there's not much available. And so many patient owners go home without any therapy, any therapy at all, because it's just not worth it. And sadly, what happens is when, when you have that happen, um, I don't know if there's despair or whatever, but you know, you, you, you can tell that they're, they're tired of it. And at, at this stage there, there's excitement. They see what's happened, you know, in the human clinic and they, they want it to be brought down into, you know, the veterinary clinic too. Yeah. And how, so tie all this in, it's really encouraging. It really is. Like if I looked back and said, oh man, I got to invest in a great company that had done this for dogs and for pets, like, wow. But, but talk to me about the money that's going to be required and how it's going to be broken down for what we need to get in over the next couple of years. Because we're going to be, be by your side to make yeah. sure that we get to the investors that we need to for this. And then speak to what the big vision is. What is that massively transformative goal that you have, which is so big, so huge, that you want to take it to. And this can be at any place in the future. So please speak to those two areas and the correlation. Right. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, we, what we look at is that it's a, it's a platform based uh, approach. And what we've seen from the human clinic is that, you know, it's not just one drug that's going to, to cure cancer. It's going to be several and they're going to be used in combination. And the way that it was done in the human clinical trials, obviously was very clunky. It took, decades for us to get two through. And now those two are used in combination and then they work brilliantly. And there's other ones they're going to start adding to. Our goal is to basically take all those and get those started together so that you don't have to waste that time. Again, you know, it's like these, you know, veterinary science and veterinary medicine is already 10 steps behind the modern use of, of, of a lot of different drugs, different approaches. So our goal is to actually catapult them beyond um, those 10 years and bring them up to speed. Uh, and one of them is, again, finding multiple targets, um, being able to address those with um, a, a platform that is safe and easy to use. And what we really wanna do is basically kind of bring those all up together, move them through in a way that um, uh, they can be used in combination. Um, we have some conversations with, with others that have sequences that we can use, we're producing other ones. So we want to build the IP structure so that when we do that, um, we can feel safe that, you know, no one's going to um, out, you know, we're not going to have any issues. It's just going to be nice and smooth. And we have the production in mind. We have everything aligned and ready to go. It's just going to take that little bit of money to, to push it through. Um, at this stage, you know, we're taking it very step by step. So the first steps are, um, right now are, are basically making sure that we get our IP aligned, get that all in place. And then the next steps will be um, early production and discussions with the FDA. From there, you know, the costs will be determined on what, you know, what size of trials they want, um, how much drug we can make and how cheap we can make it. And those are things that unfortunately, you know, as we go along, we're not going to know until we get closer. We're getting to that point, and that's the exciting part. And I think that's where um, we would like to be here in the next month or two, um, being able to actually give you really hard numbers. But at this stage, it's, it's a little difficult for us to do that. So some of the early money that we have, that we need, would help establish um, our IP, establish our production so that we can then decide how much it's going to take to do that final push into the uh, USDA regulatory process. So very small raise right now. Yeah. Bringing it through. You don't need it, which is wonderful. Like you're able to build this and get everything. You have great people in place. You have most of your costs covered yourselves anyway. You're in the right place. You're doing everything the way that you're supposed to. And there's just a small opportunity for some angels if they would like to come in and put a small investment in there. And then, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy, once we then get to that next level of being able to do some clinical validation, watch out, world. Here you come, right? Yeah, That's the I plan? Mean, yeah, we, I, and I'll, I'll tell you. I mean, we were just talking about it today, how exciting, you know, 
to, if things align the way we want, there will be a press release when we get our clinical trial approved by the USDA that will go out. And I am sure it's going to get, uh, generate tons of attention from the big boys out there, the Alancos, the Zoetises and stuff like that. They're going to see that and they're going to be like this, you know, this is, this is the future. And they're, they're moving forward and they're, they're, they're not only just pushing, revolutionizing things, they're, they're, they're doing it right here, right now <laughs> under our noses. So I don't know what will happen, but I, I do see that's going to be a really huge time point um, and a big milestone for, um, for raising money and, and for, you know, pushing the company into the next, the stratosphere. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing, I think. I, I love it. And, you know, I always think of my partner at times like this is two beautiful dogs. And, you know, for him, if I said to him, hey, you know, we have a company here and their objective is to eradicate cancer in dogs in the future. Like that's where we're going here. We're looking to get to a place where it no longer exists. Like we can literally deal with it before it even comes. And you're at the very beginning of that journey. I know that's such a huge goal and it's so far away, but it's the road you chose. Yeah. And you, we were talking about it earlier too. It's like, you know, for, for millennia, people have been looking at the moon and wanting to go there, but you know, you've got to start someplace. So, um, you know, we might just be rolling a wheel out there, but I think that as we move forward, I mean, it's, it's, it's the moonshot is a big deal. It's just going to take a lot of hard time and hard effort to get there, but we want to be a part of that. And we want to, we want to be building what we can to help. I love it, Carl. And how can everybody contact you? Every single dog lover in the world. There's no excuse. <laughs> if you're an investor, then you can get in right now. Probably the only time an individual investor is going to be able to get in on this. There's room for you. In, inquire, find out about this. If you're, if you love dogs, just help for goodness sake. Like, you know, and there's plenty of ways that you can help. Like the more uh, relationships there are with veterinarians, wonderful. Um, anybody within the regulation space, wonderful. Um, what other types of folks would be useful for you to, to connect with as well, Carl? And then also please share your email address for folks too. Right. So um, the email is actually biotessere, B-I-O-T-E-S-S-E-R-A-E, and that's at gmail.com. So that is the easiest way to get a hold of us. <laughs> we have, um, we're starting to build out further more and more uh, um, things like websites and stuff, but at the very, at the very least, this is where you can reach us right away. Um, and it's, it's, it, it's the first start in something much bigger. And we're really happy to be working with Expert Dojo and all the wonderful people that they brought on board because that's the area that we're lacking is in, in, in building you know, the, the company structure that can reach out and actually attract people. And um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I mean, that's, those are some of the people that we need right now is people to help us build the company. Um, we need people, of course, to help sell us, you know, and basically tell us, you know, that, you know, dogs are important. And, you know, these are, these are new things that can be done. I mean, there's, there's so many different groups that I've seen that have gone and, you know, there, there there's a lot of energy, but there's, they're not directed. So, um, you know, people that have lots of energy, I think we can help direct it. But at, at this stage, you know, trying to get people to help us build our company is, is important. Trying to get our word out and trying to, you know, sell the idea that, you know, it's, it's, it's not that hard for us to do it. It's, it's just a matter of effort and time and money. I love it. Let's, let's build an empire with the dogs as Kings and Queens. Thank you, Carl. Awesome. 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 Couldn't be happier that we've invested in you. This is going to be the best journey ever. We're with you all the way and everybody else. You have Carl's email. My email is brian at expertdojo.com if you want to get access to any diligence or anything else as well. And yeah, we look forward to just having you all joining us on the journey. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Carl. Thank you.